Good morning, everyone. Welcome to CNE Sales Monthly Webinar Series. I'm Jeff Butler, the Technical Manager here at CNE. Today's webinar is titled "How to Use CNE Sales to Quote Your Motion System," and we'll focus on how we can help you select the best fit motion control system for your application. Our presenter today is Kevin Young, one of our motion specialists here at CNE. He's been with us for almost 16 years and holds a BSWT from Purdue. He spent his entire career in the field of industrial automation and motion control. So just a few housekeeping items before we start. If you have questions during the webinar, please submit them using the control panel tool on the right side of your screen, and we'll address them at the end of the session. If you don't see that tool, click on the red horizontal arrow, and it should open up that little control panel. Everyone registered for the webinar will receive a link to the recording. That way, uh, if you, you know, we don't have to worry about trying to take notes throughout the presentation today because you will get uh, a link to that recording. Please be sure to attend next month's webinar hosted by Steve Wright of CNE. His topic will be Fortress, AmGuard Pro, and Industrial Ethernet, configura Configuration and Communication. This topic will cover how to integrate trap key interlock systems into your automation safety network. And that webinar will be hosted on June 14th at 1030. I'll now turn today's webinar over to Kevin. Thank you, Jeff. Is the recording active now, Jeff? It is. Oh, I'm not sorry. It is, Kevin. Okay. I'm sorry, I was muted. <laughs> okay. So, as Jeff mentioned, this is Kevin Young, Indiana Motion Specialist. And I'd like to point out there are four motion specialists at CNE Sales. And today's presentation is going to discuss how you can utilize the talents at CNE Sales, uh, specifically the motion specialist, but keep in mind there are 15 engineers on staff at CNE Sales, all specialists, um, not specifically salesmen. We cover vision, safety, sensors, PLC and automation, networking, controls, motion, and robotics. We have engineers specifically to help you pick the right solution in those fields. Today I'll be focusing on the motion. I would say my presentation, uh, instead of following the 80-20 rule, is more of the 10-45-45 uh, rule. 10% um, of the people may decide not to utilize engineering at CNE sales for whatever reason. I would say 45% at least, though, will realize they no longer need to do as much upfront work uh, before calling up CNE sales and letting us do some of the design for them. The other 45% might actually realize that only half of the design was getting done by in-house or their other vendors. The first three slides that I'm going to go through may seem a little busy, but I want to point out all the different choices there are to consider. The first slide is really just our variable frequency drive selections. Siemens has very low cost Variable frequency drive shown on the left, the V20 series. And this series actually is programmable now from your smartphone or smart device like a tablet. In the middle is the G120 series. It comes in various form factors, includes networking, Ethernet, IP, and Profinet, for example. To the right, you can see that these now come in a heat sink push through design where the heat sink can push out the back of your panel to keep heat losses outside of the panel. Below that, we have a wall mount or surface mount G110M drive. These are specifically designed to bring 40 volts in one side, daisy chain it out the other side, and these are perfect for connecting together on a 40 volt chain on the side of a conveyor. The motor lead comes out the bottom here with a cable gland giving you IP65 protection. And then to the left, is a G120D. This is a high performance G120 drive, again, an IP65 format. And these IP65 drives do not have to go in the panel, which is getting very popular nowadays. So, this first slide just illustrates all the different choices we have just on the VFD line. Now, I'm showing the servo selections. Upper left, this is what we call bookcase design. This is Typical of bringing in a 480 volt supply. The first module 
generates DC bus behind the blue covers and each of the additional modules are motor modules. Additionally, the modules on the right are double motor modules. So in 50 millimeter wide space, you can support two servo motors up to nine amp continuous. So in these first two modules, that's four servo supported in only 100 millimeters. Next module over, we can go up to 18 amp continuous in a double motor module. So at a glance, you're looking at eight servo motors controlled in a very slim compact package. To the right is a single axis servo drive from Cole Morgan. And you can see there their stainless steel servo motor that is uh, one of the best in the industry with a vented cable that goes all the way back to the panel. So when the motor's cooling off, it doesn't suck water in through the seals because it's vented all the way back to the panel for that temperature change. That's a single axis drive. Below that is a multi-axis controller from Cole Morgan that utilizes EtherCAT to connect to each of the drives downstream. And then in the middle, I have two versions of an IP65 servo motor with integrated drive on the motor. So now you're in a scenario where nothing is in the panel. The drive is out on the machine itself. And a lot of people are uh, taking note of that, even to the point where they're mounting these directly on actuators. So now you'd end up with an actuator and a servo motor mounted out on the machine, requiring very little panel space for the rest of your control. The lower left corner, in contrast, is kind of the typical single drive servo controller on the front that you may see other vendors bring to the table. So this slide illustrates, again, many choices that we have and that we plan to help you select. Okay, so this drive is, uh, this slide is even a little more busy, but to some degree that's intentional. Yeah, bear with me and I'll go through these and then um, I'll get to the point of what we need to know to help you help us make decisions on your motion solution. Upper left corner, obviously, is rod actuators. Those are getting very common for replacing air pneumatic cylinders, uh, especially if people are trying to do multi-position. That's just not easy to do with an air actuated cylinder. Also, it's getting very common to try to get hydraulic lines, hydraulic pumps, hydraulic noise, hydraulic heat out of machinery. So people are going with electric actuators. This is just the um, rod screw actuator, kind of the typical actuators. There is a heavy duty version of these also that's based on roller screw technology. I'm gonna jump over to the right at the two o'clock position. And these are the linear rodless actuators, if you will, from Tolomatic. Uh, there's solid bearing design to choose from. There's linear bearing design, which is much more rigid to choose from. Below that, I'm back to rod style actuators, but these are stainless steel. They can have an integrated motor inside the enclosure, or we can go with what's called reverse parallel belt pulley scenario to make the overall length a little shorter. Down to the right, we've got couplings. We've got in the middle gear reducers from Stober, both in a planetary or uh, power transmission design that we can help select even if your application is servo based, but it's a large high inertia load, we can combine a power transmission gear reducer with a servo if you're doing positioning with that high inertia. Let's say it's a chain conveyor, for example, a heavy gauge chain conveyor. This is a perfect solution for that. At the top, I show a stainless steel gear reducer, planetary, if you will, that goes along with that Cole Morgan stainless servo that I mentioned. Upper right corner, I show a Yaskawa Motoman robot, which we're now selling also. And we have a mirror robot to bring to the table, which is one of those autonomous uh, drive around small robots, if you will, that can do cart delivery or have a rack on top of it to do parts delivery. And lower left corner is a complete system, XYZ gantry that we can help you design and can be delivered to you turnkey, ready to go, motors on it, gear reducers on it, cable track on it, home sensors, limit sensors, everything mounted on it and can be delivered as a part number. Now, all that said, that's a lot to soak in and that's really the purpose of these first three slides. What makes CNE sales a benefit to you 
is all these choices we have. We don't come to your doorstep trying to sell you a solution until we understand what it is you need. We know that really, after the smoke clears, if you will, what you want is a material list and prices. Everything kind of starts with a budget. Before the budget though, there's a concept on what you wanted to do. We utilize the information that you already have in your mind and on your drawings to come up with that material list and help you get that initial budget. Today's presentation is gonna focus on what are the details that we need, why are we asking the questions that we're asking, and what should you plan ahead of time to bring to us with respect to the information that we will utilize to come up with a motion design for you. If you're looking for a simple two bullet, here's what I took away from this webinar, then this is probably it. For motion, something needs to move a particular distance. Point two, there's a certain amount of time allowed to move that distance. And that's really the basis of what we need to know. Now, unfortunately, physics comes into play and there's a whole lot of information we need to know for you to define what that something is. But a mistake that happens quite often is people will actually spend time calculating a speed that they think they need or a torque they thought they needed, even if it's not a thrust application. But in reality, typically the application we come back to you with isn't based on a speed request. It's based on those first two bullet points. There's a distance we had to travel and I've got so much time to do it. The software I utilize will come up with the speed. It's gonna be based on acceleration values that I put in the acceleration numbers will be corresponding to the mechanics that are being used, and the torque required is really a product of the acceleration used. So, what I'm gonna illustrate is that motion has a lot of trade-offs. A lot of this comparison and scrutiny will happen behind the scenes that we don't need to share all the different iterations with the customer until we come up with a final design. But I wanna share with you what you can expect CE sales to be doing behind the scenes to come up with a solution that is robust, cost-effective, and exactly what you asked for. In the end, you'll see that with enough information up front, I'm attempting to save you money I tend to uh, spend your money like it's my money, if you will, and the other motion guys at CNE Sales have the same mindset to where in the end, we're after a least cost, best solution so that you can be competitive if you're uh, bidding on a project or if you're the end user so that you, in the end, are getting the best value for your money. It's not uncommon for me to get a request as shown here. Uh, it's 40 inch travel, relatively light load, medium, slow, it's a vertical application, how much is that gonna cost? Now, right away, my mind does start going into possible selections. Uh, I hear it's vertical, so there's actually some advantage to going with a lead screw. It's relatively light, so again, maybe a lead screw is gonna work with a solid nut as opposed to a roller bearing. Um, I can even save some money if I go with a high inertia motor because there's, as you'll see, an inertia issue that comes into play with respect to picking a motion solution, and it's vertical, so again, I need to consider drive regen. But I'm gonna call a customer up, or get with the salesman, or even go in and visit the customer, because I need to know more information to make the decision. So as I mentioned, okay, I'm thinking maybe this can be a low cost, solid nut solution. But after visiting the customer, I find out, okay, yeah, 40 inch travel vertical, but this is really made up of 15 individual one inch moves that have to happen in three quarters of a second traveling vertical. By the way, vertic uh, light load meant 10 pound load and it was offset by six inches away from the carriage 
which is a pretty significant moment load, all this comes into play with me picking the right solution. So we're gonna start asking questions. Important is cycles per minute, but even more important is, as I mentioned, if there's multiple moves in there, we really need to know each individual move, plus we need to know your overall travel, plus we need to know how much space do you have available um, if there's an issue. If this has to fit into a really tight envelope, share that information with us and we'll make solution recommendations based on that information. Um, and of course, we're gonna get down to a point where uh, a lot of times people will just kind of take guesses at speeds and all, but in the end, I'm gonna be asking for physical length, how many seconds, how many milliseconds do I have to make that move? What kind of weight are we talking about? What is that offset? And it is okay if you're doing guesses, if you will, um, but educated guesses. Uh, as you see, there's gonna be a lot of calculations that happen based on this information. So when we bring a recommendation back to you, it's only useful if their information provided to us was useful. And as you'll see, you're going to have a summary that will tell you exactly where you stand with respect to limitations on the system that's being quoted to you. Shown here are a couple examples of applications that didn't sound too challenging, went in and visited the customer, and a whole different solution came out of the conversation. The first one on the upper left, these actuators were failing in a relatively short lifespan, a couple months actually, and we went in and looked at the application, and it's a hydraulic system right now. They wanted to go with electric system, thinking, eh, maybe that'll make the problems go away. But after looking at the application and talking to a couple of the engineers on site, we all came to the conclusion that there really wasn't a problem that an electric actuator was gonna make it go away. The problem had to do with instantaneous impact happening on the load surface above this plate here. And we all quickly agreed that if some compliance, if a spring system, a leaf spring system, or a, um, a type of spring system was able to take the impact instead of the seals on the hydraulic cylinders taking the impact, this problem probably gonna go away. And this is an application where I talked ourselves out of a sale possibly, but this is a good customer and we're doing quite a few other things with them also, not a problem. But that's what you'll find from CNE sales. We're not walking in to sell you something. On the bottom center picture, okay, it's just a simple rotary dial scenario. Um, it doesn't move very fast. And um, it was an indexing table, but it did index, so it needs to start and stop, start and stop. They were looking for a solution. Visiting the customer, we learned that there are 12 stacks of product. Each stack weighed 25 pounds each. So now we're looking at 300 pounds of mass at a 12 inch radius around that table. And again, I mentioned inertia is always a consideration with a motion application. That my friends is a whole lot of inertia. So that visit paid off in getting to the right solution to where focusing on inexpensive wasn't the right thing to do. Focusing on the correct inertia match um, which in the conversation confirmed the problem they are currently having was probably due to a big inertia match in their existing system. As you can see underneath the table, um, there was not much gear reduction and there's a very small motor dealing with that large inertia match. So, as I say sometimes, let the calculations begin. But again, the purpose of this webinar is so that you understand what are we doing behind the scenes? Why are we asking all these questions? And what information should you plan to provide to us so we can efficiently get back to you with a bill of material? We're gonna come up with a mechanical solution. Maybe it's a ball screw actuator. Maybe it's a gear reducer. But as I mentioned, eventually I'm going to be very specific about the acceleration, the deceleration, the constant velocity time, but the main thing I'm pointing out in this image is this flat line area. Dwell 
or stop motion, if you will, associated with your motion profile. So don't think that the stop time is not important. Actually, it's very important, especially in vertical applications where we need to also know, are we holding the load for that period of time? In a thrust application, are we supplying force during that period of time? So those become important and will come out in the conversation that we have with you. So once we get beyond the mechanical sizing, then we're gonna pick a motor. And as you would expect, we're gonna get into the acceleration rates, acceleration time, constant velocity. But again, simply based on what distance did you need to move and how much time do I have to complete that move, I can come up with all that information. So you don't have to worry about acceleration rates, acceleration values, that can all come out in the software that I use to size your motion application, and I will be sharing that with you in the end. So once I'm getting close to a solution, I've had various concepts in my mind. Uh, for example, let's say I'm thinking of what gear reduction would be best for a particular application, and I'm just sharing with you on this screen how my mind is thinking why we're going to come up with possible recommendations and maybe why it's better to leave that up to us and uh, here's an example why so the application parameters are shown in the uh, kind of the upper left this is without gear reduction and i was considering five to one gear reducer maybe 10 to one gear reducer but i settled on a seven to one gear reducer if you notice the rpms required was 345 rpms so we can easily think, okay, 10 to one gear reduction, we're up to 3,454 RPM. This was a relatively large torque requirement. Larger servo motors don't necessarily like going above 3,000 RPM. And also gear reducers may have a thermal issue above 3,000 RPM. So I started backing away from 10 to one. I did want as much gear reduction as possible to come up with a good inertia match load versus the motor. So I looked at five to one, I looked at seven to one. With the seven to one, it got me right into an area I'm below 3000 RPM, but if we look over at the inertia ratio in the end, I'm at 1.3 to one inertia ratio, where with servo motors, you wanna be less than 10 to one. I tend to shoot for five to one as my target, and I may consider values above or below five to one uh, depending on the encoder feedback and depending on the application. So that's the kind of thoughts that go through my mind. And I settled on a seven to one. So now I'll come back to the customer typically and have a conversation with why I picked what I did. And here's an example of a comparison I did on the application requirements, output side of the gearbox, and the gearbox rating. And what I wanted to point out here is the customer may say, okay, we only needed 1,400 inch-pounds of torque on the output side based on the acceleration that I was using, and we're somewhere around 2,400 RPM uh, on the motor input side. But this gearbox you picked is 7,000 inch-pounds rated. Why would you do that? Valid question, and I share this kind of information with the customer. If we look down at my choices, this happened to be that stainless motor and the stainless gearbox. It's an AquaTrue series. Uh, you go from the AquaTrue 120 up to the AquaTrue 160. And if we think about the torque that I was looking at, the continuous torque, uh, we're going to look at the 3,000 RPM range. There's a large step in, such a, in just going from one frame to the next of the gear reducer, uh, 600 inch pounds up to 2,000 inch pounds. And we were after something in the neighborhood of 1,100 inch pounds. So right away, the next smaller frame size was ruled out. So then the only thing I was looking at was gear ratio. And as I mentioned, I wanted the best inertia match as possible. So that zeroed me in on seven to one. So there's a lot of things that get considered before a solution is picked. And in the end, happy to share that information with our customers. Another thing that a lot of people aren't aware of, unless you're experienced on selecting servo motors, is that the motor winding or another way to say that the rated speed of a servo motor can really dictate the continuous speed, obviously, because that's what the winding is, is selected for. But 
more importantly, to some degree, if you're talking about money and cost of a solution, is the required current to run that motor at torque. The current that you need is going to dictate the drive size that you need, not just physical size, but the current going to the motor. Because it's dictating current, it's going to also dictate cable size. And then a motor selection, often related to the stack length, if you will. A lot of people know it as stack length, the overall length of the motor. Um, as you get more torque out of a motor, often they add multiple stacks, so a motor gets longer. So a motor winding could dictate an inertia match even. A quick glance at the charts show they seem a little similar, similar, but if you look closer, you notice the first top motor is really a 2,000 RPM rated motor. The bottom motor is actually a 6,000 RPM rated motor. On this next slide, this is where I was considering four various motors in a particular application. And if you notice in the rated speed column, choices were a 2,000 RPM motor, a 3,000 RPM motor, and a couple 6,000 RPM motors to choose from. One of them is labeled as a high inertia motor. Again, going back to that point, how important it is to match your motor inertia to your load inertia. So at a glance, I uh, show three of my choices down here. And my first thought, I tend to always try to make the lower RPM motor fit the application because that's less current required. You'll notice right here in the load current and maximum current required for the application, 1.27 amps, 3.89 amps max. I happen to know on this application, my drive was capable of 4.4 amps peak. So I've got a good match here, but I got a seven to one inertia ratio. So I'm gonna consider the high inertia motor. Just at a glance, that was a 2000 RPM motor. The 3000 RPM motor, as expected, needs a little more current, but really what I was after is an inertia advantage. So let's go on down to the high inertia motor. I got the inertia ratio I was after below five to one, but look what happened to the current. I need 11 amps peak current now because that's a high RPM motor. And that goes hand in hand that a high RPM motor will need more current for equal torque. So I'm gonna back away from that one. What did that do in the end for the customer? The drive to support the high inertia motor was a $700 drive. The drive to support the 2000 RPM motor was a $400 drive. The motor cost was the same, relatively the same across all four motors. So right there's $300 savings. And as you might know, with servos quite often, it's a multi-axis application. So the $300 savings adds up. So now I've zeroed in on a mechanical system. I've considered gear reduction. I've considered a motor selection. Next thing I will do is determine if the drive were to put out maximum current, what will that do to everything downstream? So again, this is typically a consideration that I'm not bothering the customer with. I'm looking at this behind the scenes and I'm seeing if there's even an issue or not. What I don't want to happen is an unexpected high-speed disassembly, as one of my customers once said. Fortunately, Scott Dixon was able to walk away from the image up on the right, and I wouldn't be a true Hoosier if I didn't have some reference to the Indy 500 here being the month of May. But I don't want that to happen to our customers. Oftentimes, when I've zeroed in on the drive and the motor now, but it's typical that I did not need full current output from that drive for that particular application. But I'll go ahead and make the next step. I will apply full torque, which is full current out of the drive into the motor, and then carry that through the rest of the mechanics and see if there's anything that is exceeding a limit. So down below, I tend to uh, highlight my boxes in green if things are good. There's been times when I've had an application where I did not need full torque rating out of a particular motor, I picked the motor based on other reasons, probably continuous torque, but the motor nameplate may have had much more torque available. For example, if you look at a motor nameplate and it says uh, 35 inch pounds continuous torque, uh, 150 inch pounds peak torque, 
Just because you're looking at that nameplate on that motor, that does not mean that is what you are getting out of that motor. It goes back to what drive is running the motor, what's the peak current output of the drive. Now, if that is less than what the peak current rating was for the motor, which oftentimes that's perfectly fine. If your application didn't need that peak torque out of the motor, now your limit is based on the drive output. So I had an application with a customer where we had a choice, the, the motor was picked, the drive required for his application was based on continuous current. So we were able to pick a relatively small drive with respect to peak current, but the motor nameplate had a lot more, a lot higher torque output. So I had a conversation with him and asked him, by the way, you could buy the next larger drive. With that drive, it's the same footprint in your panel. That's pretty typical that uh, various drive frame sizes uh, will have different current outputs. So I pointed out to him, without any more square inches inside your panel, for a few hundred dollars more, you could have a lot more torque output if you think you might need it down the road. This was a machine tool application. He really didn't know down the road if the application that we're sizing up today uh, might change and he might need more torque. He jumped on that opportunity right away to get more output torque available without using up any more panel space inside his drive and right away went to the larger drive selection. So as, as the example shows here in front of you, um, I take the motor specification, I multiply it by the ratio or whatever mechanics are involved, I've got a resulting torque now based on the simple multiplication of the ratio, and I make sure that you're not going to break the gearbox. So a quick example of what I might go into and then share that information with you. Oh, by the way, here's where here's how close you are to the limits of your gearbox, limits of your ball screw, or in that example that I was talking about, what's the weakest link in the chain? Is it the motor peak that you're going to be limited at? or is the peak based on the current output of the drive? So now that we've got a mechanical system selected, selected, sorry, we've got a motor selected, we've got a drive selected. Now I'm going to ask questions about how do you want to control this application? Single, ac plus single axis applications, believe it or not, can still be controlled by simple push buttons. Uh, today's drives have the ability to be pre-programmed with index moves and had a customer just last month. They simply wanted a drive to do the same thing every day of the week, move out 30 inches, pause, operator push the button, move back 30 inches. There was a thrust involved on the pullout, so that's really what it was designed around, but that's all he wanted. Push a button goes forward, push a button, it goes backwards. He doesn't need a PLC for that, and drives have pre-configured and stored indexes built into them if we select the right drive based on your application. You can see a simple wiring diagram on the left, and that's something else that CNE Sales helps with is recommended ways on how to wire your drive if you're using discrete inputs, for example. Also, a lot of people don't know that you can have a drive and connect it directly to an HMI still not needing a PLC involved. So if your application had five or six stop points, back and forth, if you will, but they varied from part to part to part, you could store recipes or distances to go to on that HMI panel and be able to let an operator change those distances from the HMI panel. So you've got a very simple control indexing drive, but yet you've got an HMI panel on it so that you're infinitely variable on your target positions, the speed that it's going to run, or anything else that you can program from the HMI. Both Cole Morgan and Siemens have example projects to get you off to the races with respect to using just an HMI talking directly to their drive. Oops, sorry. Now, as you might expect, it's much more common to be putting drives on a network. And with our experts that I've mentioned before on the automation side, networking side, all of our drives guys work with our automation guys 
and have proven out many different ways to connect our drives that we offer. So what's common out there, of course, when you say Ethernet, that's simply the piece of wire that is connected between the drives. What we really wanna know is the protocol that you plan to use. Ethernet IP is very popular out there in the Rockwell world, and both our Cole Morgan drives and our Siemens drives can be on those networks without a problem at all. You're, I'm sure you're familiar with add-on instruction blocks if you're familiar with the Rockwell world, and we provide sample add-on instruction blocks to operate the drives. There's a huge benefit to that, especially if you're talking about a positioning drive, because you don't need a positioning PLC. So say that again, you don't need to go up to a high-end Rockwell positioning type PLC to be able to operate a Siemens servo or a Cole Morgan servo. You just simply use an add-on instruction block and talk to them and let the drives take care of the indexing part of it. Other approaches on the PLC open format are uh, very common across the board. Uh, you can see what would be an MC power function block shown there. Uh, to do moves, you might be see an MC move jog, MC move absolute, MC move relative, and you simply fill in the variables on the left and trigger it to go. So that's a common way to talk to the Cole Morgan and the Siemens drives. And then over on the right, on the Siemens platform, thinking about the multiple MC function blocks that you need to control a motion axis, CNE cells can make recommendations on the library blocks that are available from Siemens or from Cole Morgan, where they've combined many of the MC function blocks into one, call it a user-defined function block, if you will. And inside that block, there are multiple function blocks. You drop this block in, you manipulate the inputs, and it takes care of all the various multiple MC power type blocks or MC enabled, MC reset, MC jog inside this block. It's a much easier way to drop in one block and do motion without having to drop in all the multiple blocks and the additional parameters and variables that would get assigned with that approach. CNE sales proves out solutions ahead of time and we bring these example programs and recommended function blocks to you and we can help you with your program and recommend how to use them. So I have called us uh, in our logo up there, see and easy before, because that's our goal to make things easier for the customer. We hope that you don't have to spend a lot of time in a manual trying to figure out how to implement a system that you're not familiar with. It's very common when our customers are installing servo drives for the first time, we want you to invite us in and we'll help you get it up and running. We'll help you with the scaling. We'll help you understand how the function block is communicating back to the PLC. And beyond that, even with the materials and the, the bill of material that we're putting in front of you, we're making life easier for you. If we specify a gear reducer, we've asked you which motor will go on that gear reducer because when it shows up, the motor mount will be a perfect fit for the motor that you're using and the coupling is included with the gear reducer. The same thing is true with the linear actuators. There's a motor code that indicates what motor will be mounted on that actuator and that's going to include all the bolt holes are correct, the pilot diameter is correct, the length of that motor mount is correct. Therefore, the coupling that comes with it is gonna fit. There's not gonna be any issues when it comes time to bolt these up. And that's true even if you're not buying the motors from c and &E Sales. We'll still just ask you which motor were you going to use and make sure that everything's gonna be plug and play, bolt up and ready to go. As I mentioned, the products that you buy from c and &E Sales come with startup assistance if you'd like. Remember I mentioned that there's 15 engineers on staff that are specialists and those are free for you to use. Oftentimes we get invited into customers to sit down at the big table, if you will, before a machine is designed because they want to hear what we will recommend goes into their design. So people, customers that have an ongoing relationship with CNE sales 
expect and, and hope that we will come in and make recommendations so that the design time can be shorter. As you would expect, we're going to help our customers come up with the documentations they might be after and the CAD drawings that they're looking for to quickly drop the solutions into their CAD programs. So in conclusion, I hope that you feel that you can trust c &E Sales with your application. You can bring that application to us and let us worry about the details to some degree, but know that we've got all the engineering and all the summary information that you might want to have deeper conversations about the recommendation. No one application has the same details, so there's not really a cut and dried, fill in the blank sheet to go with. Each application has a budget, and we're very aware of that. In, in our role as a distributor, quite often we're involved in competitive bid situations. And each application has a personality, and that's one of the strong points with CNE Sales, is that you can call us up, talk to us directly, invite us into your facility, and share with us the personality of your application. Each application has support at c &E Sales. Now, I've got extra time here. Um, hopefully, I didn't go too fast, but if there are any questions, uh, feel free to type in the question area or the chat area. I'm not sure which one's more effective for you. Uh, my cell phone number is there on the screen. The Dayton office phone number is on the screen. The way c &E Sales works best is we use our salesman as the quarterback, if you will. You contact the salesman, let him know what you need. He will bring in the appropriate specialist as needed. Um, but as I mentioned, feel free to call me direct also. Thank you, Kevin. Nice, nice overview of the process that we go through to try to help customers pick the right motion control solution. As you pointed out, there's really an infinite number of solutions that you can you can choose. And so uh, just dialing it in and helping the customer really get the best uh, bill of material for what he's trying to accomplish is uh, is crucial. We currently do not have any questions that have been sent to us. We'll, we'll give uh, our audience about a minute to see if anybody types anything in. Uh, Kevin is uh, one of our motion specialists, as he mentioned, and we also have specialists in various uh, other disciplines. We have vision specialist uh, that works out of the Dayton office here. We have two machine um, safety specialists. We have five automation engineers uh, that work with PLCs, HMIs, um, remote IO, RFID, remote connectivity, those kind of things. So again, a, a, we have a, such a, a broad variety of, of products that we can help you with. Uh, we would encourage you to work with your c &E salesperson who would engage your c &E specialist of the appropriate discipline to come in and take a look at your application. It's one of the things that attracted me to c &E when I started here 21 years ago was all of the attention to detail and uh, that, uh, that they put into trying to make sure they were doing the right things for their customers. Well, Kevin, I don't see any questions coming in. Everyone who attended the webinar and those who signed up and weren't able to make it today will get a link to the recording. So we'll go ahead and end the webinar and uh, you'll receive that link either today or tomorrow. Thank you for attending and please try to make sure you attend next month.